Okay, let's get going. Um, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, OPA's educational webinar, The Right Dose. Uh, we're so very happy that you're here today, and we look forward to your participation. I know it's a beautiful day, but maybe we can uh, thank Doug Ford for a stay-at-home order, so and that's why we've got some more participation this evening. Um, you just go to the next slide. Uh, my name is Ruth Ackerman. I'm the Director of Professional Development at the Ontario Pharmacists Association. Um, I'm going to be moderating this, e this evening, mostly just um, giving Tiana the questions that she'll answer. Um, tonight, we are going to talk about your patient's respiratory health. Um, during, you know, during this pandemic, we have seen countless cases where patients are taking risks by not taking care of some parts of their health care due to the concern that they have about COVID-19 and catching COVID-19 in healthcare settings. We're seeing this in cancer screening and we are certainly seeing this in immunization status amongst Canadians. Yes, they need a COVID vaccination and that's on top of mind, but they also are missing out on other very important vaccinations that they should be having. Um, I'm excited that tonight we have Tiana Tealy with us. Uh, she's no stranger to you or to this subject. Let me give you some housekeeping points. Um, we'll send you the presentation at the end of this program and you will be able to uh, have some notes and uh, Tiana will speak for about an hour and then we'll uh, have a Q&A session where she can answer some of your questions. Um, put the questions in the Q&A box and I'll go through them and give them to Tiana at the end. Um, before we move on, I just want to thank Carol McDonald at Pfizer Vaccines for her amazing support of OPA and this program and forever uh, bringing opportunities for us to better our patient care. So as Tiana gets settled in, into her slides, uh, let me introduce her. She received the direct, uh, director, her doctor of pharmacy from the University of Toronto. While earning her degree, she participated in national and international advocacy efforts while interning at the World Health Organization, the Ontario Pharmacists Association, and St. Mary's Hospital La Cor in Gulu, Uganda. Upon graduating, Tiana had completed a hospital pharmacy residency at St. Michael's Hospital and has held the position of Director of Pharmacy Innovation and Professional Affairs at Whole Health Pharmacy Partners, where she led the Banners Adult Immunization Program. I'm sure they're sad to see her go. Tiana is now a clinical pharmacy and lecturer at the University of British Columbia's Pharmacist Clinic. It's an amazing clinic there, and the work that she's going to be doing is um, uh, out, will be outstanding and uh, very forward-thinking. Uh, Tiana is passionate about optimizing the role of pharmacists and providing patient-centered care, and you can, you'll hear that in her, her uh, lecture this evening. So take it away, Tiana. Thanks so much, Ruth, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I agree that it's a very nice day outside, so really, really appreciate you joining us today. Um, but I think it just goes to show how much we're trying to do for our patients, um, and even though there's so much noise going on right now about um, COVID and vaccines and respiratory health, um, we'll hopefully bring it down today to a level where we're able to interpret that for our patients and really implement um, preventative health measures instead of just waiting um, for COVID vaccines. So I do want to disclose that um, I've received a speaker fee from Pfizer Canada, who does make um, some of the vaccines that we'll be discussing today, um, and also received a speaker fee from the OPA um, to present today's program. So in ter terms of our learning objectives, we'll hope to leave here today with these accomplished. So you'll be able to describe the impact of respiratory health, including pneumonia, on morbidity and mortality of Canadians, outline four populations at risk of pneumonia, and how at least two different members of the pharmacy team can identify these patients, describe two ways in which COVID-19 has impacted routine immunization uptake, and why ongoing vaccinations is essential, We'll review the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, or NACI, recommendations for timing of vaccine administration, including COVID-19 vaccines in relation to non-COVID-19 vaccines, 
And you'll be able to articulate three evidence-informed approaches to addressing vaccine hesitancy and statements to use in order to do so. So to set the stage a little bit, we'll talk about respiratory health. And this has obviously been quite in the news recently because of COVID-19, but we know there's more than just COVID that impacts respiratory health for our patients. This includes big categories like chronic conditions, the ones we commonly think of like asthma and COPD, but other ones that put them at risk. So things like diabetes, heart disease, kidney or liver disease, um, that all goes towards respiratory health. We also have infectious diseases. So again, thinking of COVID-19, but also existing infectious diseases that have been with us for years, things like pneumonia, influenza, um, that we wanna make sure our patients are protected against as well. And lastly, we have lifestyle factors. So things like smoking, um, that obviously increases our patients' risk of having issues with their respiratory health and we need to address that as well. Now, oftentimes this isn't top of mind, but when we look at the impact of respiratory health, two of the top seven leading causes of death in Canada are directly related to respiratory health. So that includes chronic lower respiratory diseases and influenza and pneumonia. And then we see an impact on, from respiratory health on the other leading causes of death as well, things like cancer and heart disease. Um, coming into play. Now, the good news is that there's a large role for pharmacists in respiratory health. And one of the things that we can do is really promote health through different initiatives. Things like immunizations against pneumonia, influenza, COVID-19. We have a role in chronic disease management, like making sure patients' inhalers um, and adherence is optimized for asthma and COPD and then addressing those other lifestyle risk factors. So being involved in smoking cessation. And we won't go too much in depth about the clinical background here. Um, we'll focus on the latest news and really how to make recommendations confidently that patients do accept. But if you wanna look back at additional background information, please feel free to view these through the additional OPA modules um, that are available. So there is our past module on optimizing adult immunizations, really maximizing the encounter. We have content on asthma management as well um, and landmark changes here. And lastly, we have smoking cessation. So how to implement smoking cessation services into your pharmacy practice. Now, before we get further into the content, I did want to have an audience poll question. And the first question is, have you accessed any of the OPS modules on the pharmacist's role in respiratory health? So A would be optimizing adult immunization, B would be asthma management, C, smoking cessation, or D, more than one of the above. And the reason why I'm asking this is just to get a sense of the background knowledge level in terms of um, adult immunization. So the poll is now open. Please feel free to answer and get involved in the, in the module and then we'll take it away with the actual content. We're at 50, 55% of the people have voted. So. I usually like to get to 70. And it's possible even that I actually didn't realize that none of our options say none of the above. So we might also <laughs> be seeing that, that maybe some of them haven't been touched on and that's okay. We'll just oh, spend that's a little true. bit. Yeah, <laughs> we can just spend some, some additional time on background or if people have additional questions, I can always let you know if that's covered in one of the other modules. So here's the results. Okay. Okay. So really big interest in smoking cessation, which is excellent, um, as well as some uh, who have attended the optimizing adult immunizations or multi of them, multiples of these. So for you guys, some of this information might be a refresher, although there'll be a lot of new content as well. Um, and for others who maybe haven't yet viewed the optimizing adult immunization um, module, some of this might be a, a bit quick, but feel free to hang back and ask questions at the end or do visit um, that module as well. 
Okay, so we know that pneumonia is in the top seven causes of death in Canada, um, and it's caused by various etiologies. So it can be viral or bacterial, um, and this combination of them is what lands in the top seven causes. Um, the mortality rate is quite high at about 12%, and that increases with age. So when we look at patients who are 80 and above, that's actually closer to about 20%. Um, and when we look at patients who are 65 and older, when they have to be hospitalized for pneumonia, the mortality rate also increases. Um, so it is a concern, even though um, people might not hear about it being talked as much, um, there is a concern on that mortality risk. Even those who do survive do have complications, and that can include things like worsened exercise ability, reduced quality of life, <clears throat> cardiovascular disease, and even cognitive decline. So we want to prevent it as much as possible, and we do have vaccines um, against the bacterial causes of pneumonia, the top cause being streptococcus pneumoniae. And so that's why we want to make sure everyone is immunized. It also contributes highly to healthcare costs. So in days where money is getting tighter um, and healthcare capacity is at its um, really stretched to its max, we want to try to prevent additional spending and additional uh, healthcare utilization from something that could be prevented. So looking at patients who are at risk, I like to break it into these different categories to make it easier for me to remember who to engage in conversations with. So the four big buckets that I look at are those with extremes in age. So adults 50 and over with uh, health conditions or adults 65 and older, as well as people who are in uh, chronic care facilities. We then have people with respiratory conditions. So COPD, asthma, or smoking, essentially anyone who you're dispensing an inhaler to for a chronic cause. Uh, chronic conditions. So patients who have diabetes, heart disease, liver, or kidney disease. And then lastly, individuals who are immunocompromised. And this can be due to therapy um, with things like biologics, long-term corticosteroids, um, cancer treatment, or it can be due to disease. So underlying conditions like cancer or being HIV positive. Um, those can all put our patients at risk. When we look at recent studies like the LeBlanc paper from 2020, they looked at individuals who are hospitalized with pneumococcal community acquired pneumonia. And what you can see on the slide here is that across the different age ranges, one of the big risk factors for hospitalization from community acquired pneumonia was having one or more comor comorbidities. So we know that it's not just the extremes in age, it's just as importantly people who have other conditions like the heart disease, like the respiratory conditions, um, like being overweight. Those also put our patients at risk of being hospitalized and having um, mortality from pneumonia. This similarly demonstrates that a lot of the cases are in patients 50 plus. So again, really stressing that it's not just the 65 plus and really trying to reach down into our younger patient populations as well. Now, lastly, I have a slide on how to identify these patients. And I find it really helpful if you talk to the team about what kind of things they can look out for to really trigger that conversation about recommending immunizations. So when we're thinking of the extremes in age, that's when we think of, okay, older adults. That might be people who are newly enrolled in ODB, if they're 65 plus. That could even become um, a part of the pharmacy team's approach. So every person who starts getting coverage at their 65th birthday, and we also talk about uh, immunizations. Um, or if someone's talking about retirement to your front shop staff, um, that could be a great trigger to say, okay, Maybe they're going to be getting older. Maybe they're going to be losing private coverage. Let's make sure they're updated on their vaccines. Then we have recommendations for identifying other chronic health conditions. So if we're looking at things like asthma or COPD, are they buying an inhaler or a spacer? If they have diabetes, is it someone buying insulin or a glucometer or, or test strips? 
And these are all examples that not only the pharmacist, but the pharmacy technician, assistant, um, students, front shop staff, all have a role to play. And you might find that the pharmacy assistants might be people who are dealing more with um, filling things like test strips or helping um, with uh, patients who are helping seeing patients who are picking nicotine replacement therapy. Whereas people like the pharmacy technicians or the pharmacists might be involved more with the prescription medications. And maybe they would be more on the lookout for things like insulin or Champex. So these are some tips on how to identify those patients. Now there's common questions about the different pneumonia vaccines. And so we do have both the polysaccharide, the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine um, or pneumovax, which covers for 23 serotypes. And we also have the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine or the new C13. And that covers against 13 pneumococcal serotypes. Now there is additional benefit in getting both vaccines. Some of the reasons being that you get additional strain coverage. The other reason is that the conjugate vaccine has some benefits that the polysaccharide vaccine doesn't. And when we look at this slide, we can see some of those benefits. So with the conjugate vaccine, we have a T cell response. We have a stronger immune response and an immune memory being induced. So we have that protection for longer. We also find that it provides herd immunity. And we'll talk about this a little bit later in the slides. So it's protecting not just those immunized, but also others. Lastly, with the polysaccharide vaccine, we do see some hyporesponsiveness, so a reduced response um, with additional boosters. So with the polysaccharide vaccine, we need boosters because we aren't getting that longer um, sustained immune response. But when we get additional boosters, we get less benefit from those. And then lastly, here's a slide to look at the timing of these vaccines. Um, the way I like to remember it is if you do the smaller number first, you can wait a shorter amount of time. So if you do the, uh, the conjugate vaccine that protects against 13 serotypes, 13 is smaller than 23. So you only have to wait eight weeks before the polysaccharide vaccine. Whereas if you've had the polysaccharide vaccine first, um, the 23, you have to wait a full year before the conjugate vaccine. So if you're trying to get the patient up to date on all their vaccines as quickly as possible and really protected as quickly as possible, I'd, recommending, I'd recommend doing the conjugate vaccine first so that eight weeks later, um, you can complete their pneumococcal protection with the polysaccharide vaccine. So now we'll shift from that background information, which is covered in more depth in the other OPA module about adult immunization, over to how we can protect our patients now in the context of COVID-19. So we'll talk about examples for if your patients are um, right up and due for COVID-19 vaccines and they're accessible. And we'll also talk about people who might be lower on the priority list and have their COVID vaccines a few weeks to months out. What we want to keep in mind is that we want to protect our patients now. Vaccine coverage was below target even before COVID-19, and with this, we're falling even further behind. Vaccine-preventable diseases, um, their circulation has been a bit lower due to COVID-19 measures, things like distancing, staying home, masks, hand hygiene. But once these measures are lifted, it's anticipated that we'll have a resurgence of these vaccine preventable diseases. So we wanna make sure that patients haven't been lost um, due to these measures and that when things open back up, they're protected. And that's why we wanna proactively immunize patients and coordinate it with the vaccine plans for COVID-19. This shows how Canadians are below the immunization targets. So for adults, NACI sets a coverage target of 80% uptake. Um, and when we look at a variety of different adult immunizations, we see that we're quite below these targets, especially with pneumonia in the 65 plus population, where we're only at less than 60% of patients who have received at least one dose of a pneumonia vaccine. 
and in patients with different medical conditions that put them at increased risk. So this population is even lower at only 25% uptake. So there's a lot of room for pharmacists to help increase this. And this is consistent with infants as well. So infants do have higher immunization rates, but when we look at public health schools for Ontario, the targets are about 95% coverage. And when we look at pneumonia, this actually has one of the lowest uptake rates. So we see about 76.6% of infants have received their pneumonia vaccines. And we'll talk about why this is important later, and it has to do with herd immunity in the older population, actually. Now, I'm sure you've experienced this with your patients and you've heard about it with primary care providers being closed, um, patients who are concerned about even coming into the pharmacy to get their pneumonia vaccine. Um, there's been a disruption of vaccine services and a lot of people are now at risk. Now, what I was referring to earlier with the infant rates of immunizations being important for adults is um, talked about on this slide. So in Ontario, the publicly funded 13 valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine was introduced as publicly covered for infants in 2010. This replaced um, a 10 valent uh, vaccine, which previously replaced a seven valent vaccine. And when we looked at um, rates of pneumonia post implementation, what they actually saw was that in all age groups, there was a decline in pneumonia caused by the serotypes in the vaccines. And this was most pronounced in infants less than one year old, those being immunized, as well as in adults 65 plus. And so that speaks to not only the direct impact on the person being immunized, but the herd immunity in preventing older adults. So we're not seeing that colonization in the infants and younger children, um, which could then actually lead to pneumonia in people like their grandparents. So when we look at rates of immunizations being reduced in infants and in adults, we might see this in more susceptible older adults, 65 plus, once um, measures for staying at home are lifted. And so NACI has put out these interim guidance on immunizations, and they too recognize that there's disruption in immunization services, um, that later when we relax our public health measures and there's international reopening, we might see a resurgence of these vaccine preventable diseases, and that that may cause an increased burden on the healthcare system and people who were lost to follow up might have a more difficult time being caught up and getting up to date with their vaccines. So they make the recommendation to continue immunizing um, and continuing to stress this to patients, especially in patients who are vulnerable. So the older adults, those who are immunocompromised um, as well. And we want to include reminders um, and recalls and adding notes to patients' uh, charts to make sure that these patients are caught if they're not caught now before uh, COVID-19 measures are lifted. Now, when we look at NACI's measures for immunizations with regard to the COVID-19 vaccine, they make a few recommendations that I'll review today with everyone. The first is that a complete COVID-19 vaccine series should be offered to individuals in the authorized age groups. So we don't want to delay COVID-19 vaccines in order to receive other vaccines, but we do wanna make sure that we're not delaying other vaccines in order to be um, waiting for COVID-19 vaccines that aren't yet available to these patients. We also wanna figure out how to work the timing so that patients who have received a COVID-19 vaccine don't have to wait until their entire series is done before getting their um, other vaccines like pneumonia. And this is because in part um, that the COVID-19 recommendation is to maximize the number of individuals benefiting from the first dose by extending the second dose up to four months. So because we're extending this window of COVID vaccines, we are potentially waiting a longer period of time if we're waiting for all their COVID-19 series to be done before moving on to vaccinating against other um, 
respiratory conditions. So instead, we want to see how we can time it so that by the end of that four months, they're up to date not only on their COVID vaccine, but their pneumonia vaccine as well. And all individuals should practice public health measures regardless of vaccine status. There's also recommendations that COVID-19 vaccines can be offered to individuals who have had COVID-19, are immunocompromised, and are pregnant and are breastfeeding. So a lot of pharmacists are getting questions, especially about patients who are immunocompromised and patients who are pregnant and are breastfeeding. And some of this has to do with the fact that the trials for COVID-19 uh, vaccines didn't have a large population that was representative of individuals who are immunocompromised or pregnant. What it did have, though, was patients who could get pregnant. So it wasn't an exclusion criteria if someone planned to get pregnant. And so in turn, some people who were involved in the original trials have since gotten pregnant, and they are doing additional evaluations to uh, obtain additional data here. There have been many individuals who are pregnant or breastfeeding who have been immunized, and they've been part of post-marketing surveillance, and there's currently no reason to think that the vaccine is unsafe for them. And so it is a discussion with patients about the risks and benefit one of the big things being the risks of not being vaccinated and that potential risk of COVID-19 on the pregnant uh, parent as well as the fetus. In terms of immunocompromised adults, the vaccines that are currently available um, aren't live attenuated vaccines. And so we don't have a concern that it could replicate or cause the COVID-19 in individuals. Um, so that can be something that's communicated to patients. And again, letting them know that as individuals who are immunocompromised, they are at greater risks of COVID-19. And so we want to make sure they're protected. They might get a, a less strong response from vaccines um, because they're not able to mount as great of a response, but it would still be a greater response than no vaccine. And then lastly, they actually mentioned that efforts should be made to improve knowledge about the benefits of vaccines in general and address misinformation and communicate transparently. So it's going beyond COVID-19 vaccines and saying we need to educate the public on the safety and benefit of vaccines in general and making sure everyone's up to date. Now, one of the questions I have now um, is to understand what people's understanding is of the timing for immunizations in relation to the COVID-19 vaccine. So this is a bit of a knowledge testing question. If you provided a pneumonia vaccine to your 55-year-old patient with COPD today, when could they receive a COVID-19 vaccine? And the options are on the same day, 14 days later, 28 days later, or I'm not sure. Oh, we've got 80, 85% people voted already. Okay. okay, I'm gonna end the polling and I'm gonna share the results. Okay, so the question was, if you provided a pneumonia vaccine to your 55-year-old patient with COPD today, when could they receive a COVID-19 vaccine? And um, the top response had a little bit under 50%, was 14 days later, um, which, which we will talk about in a bit. Um, and the next um, responses were a bit of a mix. Um, with regards to timing, um, including about 15% of people who said they weren't sure. So I will uh, go to the next slides and we'll talk about this example. So in general for vaccines, the recommendation is that uh, vaccines can be administered concurrently, whether they're live or inactivated. If they're, um, if they're live vaccines, um, you need to wait at least four weeks between vaccines um, if it's not administered on the same day. If they're not live vaccines, they can be administered with any relation to each other. The new exception here, though, is with COVID-19 vaccines. 
So with COVID-19 vaccines, we don't have as much data. So we're still a bit hesitant and still observing. Right now, the recommendation is that we would not administer a COVID-19 vaccine on the same day as another vaccine. We would wait at least 14 days before a COVID-19 vaccine and at least 28 days after a COVID-19 vaccine in order to give another vaccine. And so this can be a bit difficult to visualize. And so I've put it together on this slide here. So essentially, what we're saying is that if someone receives another vaccine, like a pneumonia vaccine, you want to wait 14 days before their COVID-19 vaccine. And if they've received a COVID-19 vaccine, you want to wait 28 days before another vaccine. And so if your patient received a, um, a COVID-19 vaccine, you would want to wait that 28 days. If it was a patient who you gave a pneumonia vaccine to, like our example of the 55-year-old patient who had COPD and was immunized against, co against pneumonia, we would have to wait the two-week time frame before the COVID-19 vaccine. So that majority of the group, almost 50%, correctly answered you would wait 14 days before giving a COVID-19 vaccine. Now, some of the reasons why we wait 20 days after the COVID-19 vaccine are because we're monitoring for adverse events uh, related to newer vaccines. And so we don't want to kind of muddy the picture by giving another vaccine where then we're not sure if the adverse event is from that vaccine or from the COVID-19 vaccine. So that's part of the reason as well. Some jurisdictions like the BC CDC have gone ahead and recommended you can shorten that duration. Um, but the NACI recommendation is currently 14 days before and 28 days later. So again, I like to use that thinking of um, the shorter number before or first and the longer number, the bigger number, 28 days after, after. I've included a slide here as well to show you how this can be used to provide pneumonia vaccines. So we know that there's two pneumonia vaccines. There's the conjugate vaccine, as well as the polysaccharide vaccine. And we want to wait eight weeks between those if we've given the conjugate vaccine before the polysaccharide vaccine. We also have the two doses of COVID-19 to consider. So we have dose one, and then the four months or 16 weeks that's being recommended, and then dose two. And so on top of that, we want to think about the relation between each of those vaccines. So if we started with the conjugate vaccine, we would give that pneumonia vaccine and then wait at least two weeks. So having that 14 days before a COVID-19 vaccine. So that's weighted here. And then after the COVID-19 vaccine, we'd want to wait at least 28 days before another vaccine. And in this case, it's even more than 28 days. It's six weeks to make a total of eight weeks between the pneumonia vaccines. Then after that pneumonia vaccine, we'd have to wait at least 14 days before getting another COVID vaccine. And sticking with that four month um, recommendation between the two COVID vaccines, that could be, for example, 10 weeks later. So that's how you could actually space um, in this time frame of 18 weeks, um, two pneumonia vaccines and two COVID vaccines. And then you'd make sure that in that slightly over four month period, your patient's protection for their respiratory health is optimized. And again, just a quick reminder of the timing between the pneumonia vaccines, as well as the recommendations for uh, boosters for the polysaccharide vaccine. So if the patient was under 65 and received a polysaccharide vaccine, um, when they turn 65, we'd want to give them another dose, um, as long as it's been separated by at least five years. So after this 18-week uh, period, for example, in the last slide has passed, um, again, later in a few years, when they're due for a polysaccharide booster, that can be given as well. 
Now we'll talk about some common questions that come up and how to address vaccine hesitancy, especially as patients might be prioritizing COVID-19 right now and forgetting a bit about other factors that impact their respiratory health. So one of the big things that comes up is how and when to have conversations with patients. And again, I like to think of little triggers to help these conversations. That can be things like associating it with different opportunities to initiate conversations. Things like patient milestones. So we talked about retirement as well as um, a 65th birthday or 50th birthday. Um, looping it into things like annual influenza vaccines. So mentioning that influenza immunization helps keep their lungs healthy, but that pneumonia is equally as important to protect against. Um, and it's in that top seven leading causes of death along with influenza and making sure they're protected um, from that. A good time is also when speaking about travel vaccines. So I know right now patients aren't um, traveling, no one's really traveling, but soon we will resume travel. And people have always been quite open to travel vaccines. And so if you know your patient has an open mind to vaccines because you see you're dispensing and administering travel vaccines, it can be a good opportunity to loop in other adult immunizations and make sure they're completely up to date. And then lastly, right now, a lot of people are probably asking about COVID-19 vaccines. And even if they're not available in your pharmacy, a good option can be to have the conversation with them saying, we don't yet have COVID-19 vaccines available for your age group, but what you can do to protect your lungs now is to get a pneumonia vaccine. And let's talk about if that's right for you. Now, in terms of how to discuss vaccinations, you can think of it in five steps. So you want to identify eligible patients. This can be based on medical history and chronic comorbidities. You can offer screening questionnaires to help determine eligibility along with things like influenza immunizations or travel health screening forms. Um, you can also display educational materials prompting patients to self-identify um, or even flag the bag of an eligible patient during the prescription processing so that you have a conversation with these patients. You then want to initiate a discussion at the points of contact. So these can be different based on the different team members' roles. It can be at drop-off with a pharmacy assistant. It can be at counseling by the pharmacist. It can be at the point of um, providing test strips if it's the pharmacy technician. So incorporating those into existing points of contact. The next step is to educate patients about the risks of disease and the vaccine benefits. So we want to also communicate the potential risks of vaccines so that they feel like they're making an informed decision and that builds trust in your relationship together. Lastly, you want to recommend with confidence based on that patient's specific risk factors so that they know that it's right for them and they know that you believe in the recommendation. Studies have shown that with stronger recommendations, patients are more likely to accept it rather than a bit of a weaker suggestion. And lastly, you want to vaccinate and follow up. So make sure that they do get that second pneumonia vaccine, for example, or that second dose of COVID-19 vaccine. Some tips that have been produced by Canadian family physicians are on this slide, and it's how to use evidence-based approaches to recommending vaccines. So the first one, which is really big, is using a presumptive approach. So saying things like, you're due for two vaccines today, let's get you vaccinated to keep you healthy. And this is in contrast to saying something like, oh, you're due for vaccines today, would you like to get vaccinated? Or would you like me to contact your physician for a prescription? So really making a force, um, uh, sorry, not a forceful, but a presumptive approach where you're encouraging them um, to get vaccinated by kind of assuming that they like to get vaccinated and they can tell you otherwise if that's not the case. Next, you wanna address concerns and make a strong recommendation. So you can say things like, I strongly recommend you receive these vaccines today, or these shots are very important for protecting you against serious diseases. 
And so one of the reasons why we take this approach is that a common reason for patients saying they're not up to date on vaccines is that no healthcare provider made a recommendation to them or they didn't realize that these vaccine preventable diseases were serious conditions. So you can talk to them about the benefits of these vaccines, the fact that vaccines work, that serious diseases can occur if not immunized, and you can pull from those points we talked about, about the mortality risk associated with pneumonia, and even the risks of the long-term complications if they're not as concerned about dying from pneumonia, for example. Lastly, you want to take an honest approach with them and describe side effects. Um, so letting them know that there is a risk with vaccines, just as there is with everything in life, like driving a car or riding a bike. And one of the reasons why we want to do this is that if we say things like there's no risk of side effects or it won't hurt at all, um, that can impact the trust they have with you if they do in fact experience side effects and the needle does hurt a little bit. So by preparing people for this, they're be better able to be prepared mentally and have that ongoing trusting relationship with you. There's also approaches to addressing vaccine hesitancy. So the first is to be honest about these side effects and the robust vaccine safety system. So you can mention things like there have been systematic reviews that showed that serious adverse events associated with vaccines are extremely rare, similar to getting hit by lightning, for example. Um, but these perceived risks can actually be lowered when we acknowledge them. We can also let them know that the Canadian vaccine safety system is quite robust. It's an eight component system, and there are many randomized control trials that have gone towards ensuring vaccines are safe before they're approved, um, and that there's also a post-marketing surveillance that's ongoing. So this is true for COVID-19 vaccines, as well as other vaccines. One thing that also works with addressing vaccine hesitancy is telling stories in addition to providing scientific facts. So some of the big anti-vax movements actually use this quite strongly, where they tell stories to get to people's emotions. Um, and so one of the things we can do to combat that is also telling stories. We want to tell true stories, but they can be used to um, convince people who are skeptic, and you can make personal statements. So things like I've been vaccinated against pneumonia, or I've received my COVID-19 vaccine. I made sure that my parents received their pneumonia vaccines, um, or I recommend this to all my patients, um, and they found that the side effects were quite manageable. Things like that. You also want to build trust by making the patient feel like they've been listened to and that you tailored your answers and responses to their specific concerns and their specific risk factors. So it might be finding time in something like a medication review where you have five minutes to dedicate to this conversation um, and really making sure that everything is tailored to them. And lastly, it's been beneficial to focus on protection. So really driving home that it's not just COVID-19 that impacts respiratory health, but that vaccine preventable diseases like pneumonia are quite serious um, and that this should be addressed through immunizations. Now, I think going through a bit of an exercise might help with responding to questions you might get from patients. And so I've put some common questions that I get here on this slide. And before showing some potential answers, I'll just give you a minute to think about what you could actually respond to a patient. It's helpful to kind of come up with these responses in advance so that you're not caught off guard and you're able to make a confident um, answer to patients. So the first question um, is, is the vaccine safe? And the next question is, I'm up to date on my immunizations. So less of a question and more of a statement, but what would you do if a patient said this to you when you tried to engage with them about being immunized? And you can feel free to put it in the, in the chat box or you can even think it to yourself. And in about a minute, we'll just go over some um, examples on how to respond.
Okay. So one of the potential responses to is the vaccine safe draws on some of the points that we went over in the past slide. So you can say things like Canada has one of the most robust vaccine approval processes. Vaccines go through trials on thousands of individuals before approval and surveillance is ongoing once they're on the market. The most common side effects are injection site redness, soreness and pain or feeling unwell for a couple of days. I'm confident in vaccine safety and want to make sure that you get vaccinated. Is there a specific safety concern you have? And so this uses those evidence-based approaches. It makes that strong, confident recommendation. It tailors the response to that specific patient by asking if they have certain safety concerns. It has a truthful approach to the common side effects that might be experienced. And it also speaks to providing information on the safety that vaccines um, have. The next question is more of that statement if a patient just tells you, um, I don't need to be vaccinated because I'm up to date on my immunizations. And because we know that there's a lot of patients who actually aren't immunized or think they're immunized but may not actually be up to date, um, we wanna still engage in conversation with these patients and do a check with them. So you can respond saying something like, that's wonderful to hear. Um, let's take a couple of minutes to review the vaccines recommended for adults for your age and with your health condition to update your file so we can reach out when you're due for any others. So you're indicating here to patients that you're listening to them and you hear that they're up to date, but that you still want to go through it with them so that you can reach out and have a reminder when they are due, maybe when they hit 65 or 50, for example. This can also be really beneficial because it can be an opportunity to find maybe that they aren't up to date and that you wanna engage with them. Deanna, I just wanted to mention that um, someone put in the Q&A um, that in their pharmacy, they reassure patients by telling them that everyone that works here has had their first COVID-19 vaccine with no problems. Exactly. And so that's a really important thing saying, I've received my COVID-19 vaccine. I'm open to receiving any of the COVID-19 vaccines offered to me. Um, those are all important things to say. One thing that might come up is, is it pneumonia for old people or is it pneumonia not that bad? Can you just take antibiotics for it and move on? And so some potential responses here, and you can think of what your own would be, but we have things like, while adults older 65 are at high risk for pneumonia, risks for pneumonia and complications are higher even in younger adults, so 50 to 64, who have chronic health conditions. Since you're 55 and have diabetes, for example, I strongly recommend you get vaccinated today. So again, this speaks to the benefits of immunizations and the risks of not being immunized and really stressing to them that you strongly recommend it, as well as stressing to them that there are serious risks, including hospitalization, ventilation, and ultimately mortality. The next response for isn't pneumonia not that bad, um, can you just take antibiotics for it? You can respond to by saying something like, pneumonia is a serious disease that can occur if you're not immunized. Those who survive may experience long-term effects like cognitive decline and lower quality of life. While we currently have antibiotics that work against bacterial pneumonia, resistance to these medications is growing and it's getting harder to treat. It's better to prevent it altogether. So again, really stressing the importance of immunizations, um, making the potential risks of immunizations real to patients and letting them know that we wanna prevent rather than treat for a few reasons, including the fact that antimicrobial resistance is making it harder to find treatment options. Now there's an increasing role in immunizations, especially with COVID-19 for pharmacy technicians. But beyond actually administering the vaccine, there's also a role in recognizing, relaying, and referring patients who are due for immunizations. And so while the pharmacy technicians might not speak to the therapeutics of the immunizations, they have just as an important role in identifying these patients, um, relaying that the pharmacy recommends immunizations to patients and referring them to pharmacists for vaccine-specific conversations. 
Now, in terms of how to integrate vaccines into your practice, like many other things in pharmacy, I would say start low and go slow. So you don't have to make a drastic practice overall. You don't have to be immunizing every single patient against every single adult preventable disease. Ultimately, maybe that's our goal, but I think biting off a smaller piece to begin with is realistic and can still provide a lot of benefit to your patients. You can slowly integrate things like vaccine education, recommendations, and or administration. So even if you're not administering, that education and recommendation is also very important. So you can work with your pharmacy team to develop impactful yet attainable goals. And so maybe that's doing one recommendation per day. Maybe it's one target population at a time. So saying every time we dispense an inhaler, we're going to have this conversation about respiratory health, COVID-19 vaccines, and pneumonia vaccines. Um, or it can even be pivoting your COVID-19 conversations to touch on other adult immunization conversations as well. So saying something like, we're currently accepting for our wait list for COVID-19 vaccines, but what we can get you today is a pneumonia vaccine to help protect your lungs while you're waiting. And I have a case example to go through a few of these points. Before we get to the example, I'll just ask a question to the audience, which is, are you providing COVID-19 vaccines in your pharmacy practice? And the options are yes, um, you have enough supply for demand and you're currently immunizing. Uh, yes, but you don't have enough supply for demand, so you're waiting for another shipment. No, not yet in your region, or no, and you don't plan to in your practice. We have 50%, Tiana. Okay. And some people might be undecided too. Kind of stuck a little bit at 62. <laughs> Okay, let's just, I'll share the results. Sure. Okay, so um, kind of a mix, about 20% of people are involved in some capacity currently, um, about 35% saying not yet in your region, um, and about 40% saying um, not planning on having it in their practice. So for both the population who are involved in immunizations right now and those who don't yet have it in your region, um, the next case will go through how you might deal with the situation a bit differently based on that COVID-19 um, vaccine availability. So the case example is with Mossum. And so Mossum has COPD and hypertension, no allergies, but she's taking teotropium, ramipril, amlodipine, and indapamide. She currently smokes about half a pack of cigarettes daily, and she comes into your community pharmacy picking up a prescription um, for Champix starter pack and buying nicotine replacement therapy, the patch, and the gum. And so this can be an excellent opportunity to go through the steps of getting patients vaccinated. And again, those five steps were identify eligible patients initiate a discussion at points of contact, educate about the risks of disease and vaccine benefit, recommend with confidence, and vaccinate and or follow up. So for that first step of identify and initiate, all pharmacy team members have a role. And in Mossum's case, there's different members who might identify her at, as being at risk of um, a respiratory infection like COVID and pneumonia because of different reasons. So the pharmacy assistant, for example, might notice that Mossum is purchasing nicotine replacement therapy, and that's a trigger that she currently smokes and is at higher risk because of the lifestyle factors. The pharmacy technician, when processing the prescription, might notice Mossum's age 
and know that patients who are older, um, 50 plus with other health conditions are at increased risk of COVID-19 and pneumonia. And the pharmacist, for example, when counseling, um, might be speaking to the patient and notice that they have asthma or COPD um, and that they use these inhalers. And so they're at risk because of those health conditions. So different triggers for different individuals, but all leading to that recognition that Mossum's at increased risk and needs to be vaccinated against pneumonia. The next part is addressing that vaccine hesitancy and educating on the disease risks and vaccine benefits. And so some potential options for saying things could be like, our pharmacists can give you more information about some vaccines you may need that we offer in the pharmacy. You can get your vaccination as soon as today. So that can be something that the pharmacy assistant or technician could mention. Um, one thing that you could say that's specifically related to Mossum would say, I see you're quitting smoking. That's an excellent way to improve your lung health. An important other way to protect your lungs is with pneumonia vaccination. Your age and COPD put you at risk, so I strongly recommend vaccinations today. And you'll decide on which approach you like best and works into your practice best, but these are some examples you can refer to um, for some help. The next part would be to recommend, vaccinate, and follow up. And so we wanna keep in mind the COVID-19 immunization rollout in your region. And you wanna balance interfering with those COVID-19 immunizations, given that vaccine timing and local rollout with the ongoing risk of pneumonia and susceptibility as pandemic measures are lifted. So keeping in mind that in relation to the COVID-19 vaccine, we need at least 14 days before or 28 days after um, for another vaccine. What's really important, and I'm not sure if you've seen this cartoon before, is um, when patients are offered a certain vaccine, for example, and they're saying, I'll wait for the next one. But what's important is that we don't delay protection, thinking that we're going to get better things or other things, because um, that can really put our patients at ongoing risk while they're waiting for things that might take weeks or even months to come, depending on their region and their risk factors and their age. So you wanna protect patients now. Do keep an eye on the local and provincial vaccine rollout um, so that you know what's going on in your region. If you're in a region where vaccines um, are available soon, so they're not yet available. So for example, if Mossum lives in an area where vaccines or vaccine appointments for adults 60 to 64 are weeks away, then this would be our recommendation. So it's possible that COVID-19 vaccines are available in her region, but appointments are being booked two weeks out. In that case, this would also apply. Or it could be that she's in a region where the vaccines aren't yet available, um, or for other patients where they're not yet in the age zones where they are recommended, then this situation would apply. So we would want to provide a conjugate pneumonia vaccine today or as soon as possible. And then at least 14 days would pass before their COVID-19 dose. So again, if they're booking two weeks out, it's a perfect opportunity to give a conjugate pneumonia vaccine now and start that protection um, for the lungs instead of waiting for that vaccine to be available. And then we want to wait um, at least 28 days after the COVID-19 vaccine to get another immunization, like the polysaccharide vaccine, where we would wait at least another six weeks so that the total period between the pneumonia vaccines is eight weeks. And then again, after that polysaccharide vaccine, we wanna wait at least um, 14 days before the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and in some case, it might be quite um, long, uh, depending on the spacing between the two COVID doses. If vaccines are currently available, then I wouldn't delay getting a COVID-19 vaccine to get a pneumonia vaccine, but it means that we can quickly follow up with the patient um, to make sure that they don't wait until the end of their COVID um, series before starting to get that pneumonia protection. So for example, if Mossum received her COVID-19 dose today or even a few weeks ago, we would only have to wait 28 days before she could get the conjugate vaccine. Then eight weeks later, she could get the polysaccharide vaccine. 
ensuring that she completes that coverage in that eight week period. And then finally, we would want to wait at least 14 days after the polysaccharide vaccine to get her second COVID-19 dose. And it'll probably be even longer again with that 16 week period. So for people who are in regions that are currently immunizing against COVID, um, protection against COVID and pneumonia could be completed within that four month period. And this is much better than waiting until after those four months to then start um, getting pneumonia protection. So in this example, the pharmacy assistant, technician, and the pharmacist identify that Mawson's at risk of pneumonia and start the vaccine conversation. The pharmacy assistant and technician recognize the risk, relay it to the patient and the fact that we can offer immunizations, and then refer to the pharmacist for further conversations. The pharmacist uses that presumptive language saying, you're due for vaccines, let's get you a pneumonia vaccine today and make such strong recommendations. So I've been immunized against pneumonia. I've been immunized against COVID-19. I strongly recommend that you do that because you're at risk um, because of your other health conditions like COVID, uh, like uh, COPD. The local public health unit and community pharmacies um, are booking COVID-19 vaccine appointments in two weeks for adults 55 plus in the case of Mossum City. So to protect Mossum now, the pharmacist immunizes her against pneumococcal disease today with a conjugate pneumococcal vaccine. And in 14 days, she'll be eligible to receive her COVID-19 dose once it's available. The pharmacist then provides an update to Mossum's nurse practitioner and recommends that the nurse practitioner provide Mossum with publicly funded polysaccharide vaccine in eight weeks, spacing it from the COVID-19 vaccine by a minimum of 14 days before or 28 days after. And so I've also included some tools and resources that you can print out and either keep in your pocket um, of your lab coat, for example, or uh, behind the pharmacy um, dispensary near the computer, for example, to help act as a reference for questions that you might get or tools for addressing vaccine hesitancy. These ones are for vaccine hesitancy. So there's the ask uh, desk reference, there's a communication tool by Immunize BC, and there's also a nice tool by the BC Center for Disease Control that talks about the relative risks of disease and immunization for people who might be a bit more concerned about risks associated with immunizations and who might not yet have an appreciation for the risks of vaccine preventable diseases. The next one is uh, vaccine public awareness materials. So these can be put up in your pharmacy to engage patients and start helping them self-identify as being at risk and recognizing the risks. So that can be social media, social media content from Immunize Canada, as well as posters um, about vaccine safety and macaulay disease, all by Immunize Canada. These can also be shared on social media. So that could be a good way to get patients in um, to your pharmacy talking about these things. And then lastly, some quick reference guides, including a recommendation overview from Immunize Canada. So the different adult immunizations that are recommended and for which groups they're recommended, as well as a Q&A for common questions that people have about immunizations. Things like, why do I need this? Um, and uh, who should be immunized. I've also included a reference on vaccine schedules. One thing to keep in mind is that vaccines that are part of a publicly funded immunization program in the majority of provinces and territories in Canada count as schedule two vaccines. And so they don't need a prescription in order to be administered by the pharmacist and dispensed by the pharmacist. And so pneumonia vaccines fall within this, um, and that includes pneumococcal conjugate and polysaccharide vaccines. Um, some patients might require a prescription for the conjugate vaccine, uh, more to do with their private insurance coverage. And some patients might be eligible for publicly funded conjugate or polysaccharide vaccine. And so those patients would be referred to um, someone who could provide a publicly funded vaccine. And then lastly, to keep up to date with COVID-19 updates, because things are changing all the time, 
I've included links here on COVID-19 rollout plans in Ontario, as well as pharmacy locations that are participating in the vaccine rollout. And then some of the NACI recommendations on COVID-19 vaccines, as well as timing of vaccine administration. And so we'll now go over to questions, um, but some final points to leave you with are key learning points that patients over 50 and those with comorbidities are at risk of pneumococcal morbidity and mortality in Canada. Adults and infant immunization rates were below target prior to COVID-19 and they're likely even lower now. While COVID-19 has reduced the spread of some infectious diseases, there may be a resurgence of vaccine preventable diseases once measures are lifted. And so we wanna make sure our patients are protected now. NACI recommends that vaccines be given 14 days before or 28 days after a COVID-19 vaccine. And pharmacists should make strong recommendations addressing any concerns and educating on benefits and side effects to ensure patients don't wait to be vaccinated. Okay. And these are the references in case anyone would like to visit those and read more about them there. That was absolutely fantastic, Tiana. I love the line that shows before and after. I think yeah. It's so hard to keep straight. I honestly, I just have to print that out and keep it with me or else I always can't keep it straight. So hopefully um, others can print it out as well if you'd like, because um, it'll help with the timing, not only of the COVID-19 vaccines and pneumonia vaccines, um, but even the timing between pneumococcal vaccines um, themselves. Exactly. Um, so here's another one you could put on that little, um, on your line there is, um, what is the ideal wait time between a COVID vaccine and Shingrix? Yeah, so same recommendations, and, and let me bring back the example um, here. So same recommendations for um, really any other vaccine um, besides the COVID-19 vaccine. So if you were going to give a Shinrix vaccine, for example, you could give that today and then wait at least 14 days before the COVID-19 vaccine, and then wait at least 28 days before um, another Shinrix dose, which we know we're waiting a longer period of time anyways because of the timing between the Shinrix doses themselves. But as long as it's been at least 28 days, um, you can give that second Shinrix dose. Similarly, if the patient has received the COVID-19 vaccine or is about to imminently, you would want to wait at least 28 days, and then you could do that first Shinrix dose, and then you could actually finish the COVID-19 series, and then even get that second Shinrix dose. So same rules apply in terms of at least 14 days after Shinrix and at least 28 days before it in relation to the COVID-19 vaccine. Another thing to note actually on the, on the topic of other adult immunizations is that you could give Shinrix and Prevnar on the same day. Those ones are still able to be given on the same day and then wait the 14 days between the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, similarly, after a COVID-19 vaccine, you would wait at least 28 days, but then could give both Shinrix and Prevnar, for example, on the same day. Good addition. Um, is Prevnar, does Prevnar need to be re-administered or is it once in a lifetime? So it's a once in a lifetime. Um, so that one doesn't need to be re-administered. For the Pneumovax 23, that would be the one that requires the boosters. And that kind of goes back to the fact that it's a conjugate vaccine, the Prevnar vaccine. So we're getting that stronger immune response and that longer immune response. Um, so we don't need those boosters. Thank you. Uh, should all patients over 65 be vaccinated with Prevnar 13 vaccine regardless of their medical conditions? So I would recommend it for all patients over 65. We know that age in itself is a risk factor. Um, patients who are 65 and also have additional health conditions would be at even increased risk. Um, it does require a conversation with the patient and seeing what their views are on um, vaccines and the risks and benefits. But when we look at vaccines, 
the benefits we know are significant in terms of preventing diseases that are quite serious like pneumonia, whereas the risks are in relation quite minor. So those minor injection site pains um, being the most common ones. So I would recommend it even for patients 65 plus who don't have other health uh, comorbidities. Okay, thank you. Are there any studies that speak to pneumococcal vaccination lowering COVID-19 severity and death? So that I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of any studies um, speaking to that yet. We do know that pneumonia can be a complication of COVID-19, but I think as the situation is evolving so much, um, this is still being ongoing and being studied. But what I would try to do is give my patients kind of the best chance. So we want to make sure their lungs are protected and they're in their optimal health and condition um, so that even if they were to get COVID-19, they're going in with kind of the best set of lungs they can. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, this one is one of the ones that um, came before our, um, our uh, we started this evening. Do you think pharmacists should be lobbying to get pneumonia vaccines covered by ODB for seniors to save money on antibiotics and hospitalizations? Yeah, I mean, I, I strongly believe in vaccines, so I believe there's a greater role for pharmacists. So maybe you're asking the right or the wrong person, but um, but I would say I think all healthcare providers have a role in this, and especially now that pharmacists are immunizers um, for conditions like pneumonia, we do have a role in advocating for things like public coverage and additional vaccines to be within our scope of practice, um, even. I would say in the future, like prescribing authority for these vaccines so that if yes. a prescription is needed for coverage, that's something we could get them. Um, so I, I would agree. Um, and I will leave that with Ruth and the OPA <laughs> to advocate well, for. I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk to the powers that be and see what I can, I can do. Um, um, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, but yes, I, I do think it's important. And I think from a health economics perspective, um, there's potential there as well, because like we're saying, we know there's risks in terms of running out of antibiotics to treat these things, um, the costs of um, conditions where there is antimicrobial resistance, the cost of hospitalizations, ventilation, um, healthcare follow-up, um, time off work, um, all, all very costly items. Absolutely. Um, so this question you can answer or I can answer, it's up to you. Can pharmacy technicians administer the pneumonia vaccine if they have received injection training? So I will, I can answer this, but Ruth, definitely correct me if I'm, if I'm mistaken. But my understanding is that for right now, um, pharmacy technicians scope of practice is currently limited specifically to COVID-19 vaccines. Exactly. You're right. That's the, the only vaccine that, uh, technicians can administer and is always under the supervision by a, a healthcare professional who has administration of vaccines in their scope of practice. So we couldn't even uh, delegate it to uh, pharmacy technicians because they, they don't have it in their scope. Cross your fingers that um, that will happen and soon. Uh, COVID makes it very difficult for uh, some of this, some of these regulations to go through, but I you know, you can see from the from the college that they're uh, supporting programs that cover all seven competencies. We're we have to demonstrate uh, intramuscular, subcutaneous injections, and of course, COVID nineteen are just in intramuscular injections. So I think I think we're sort you know we could cross our fingers. I have no inside information whatsoever, but we can cross our fingers that perhaps they're laying the groundwork so that th that can happen and be enabled uh, quickly. So, because all the pieces are in place right now, we've got techs that are trained and that they're educated and they've been assessed. And um, that would be lovely if they can, um, I know a few pharmacists that would just love it if, <laughs> if their um, pharmacy techs could do the, the flu vaccines this fall. Yeah, and I always see it as kind of that that stepping stone or that foot in the door, the same way pharmacists first got influenza vaccines, and then that expanded to additional vaccines. Um, maybe hopeful thinking, but maybe it starts with COVID-19, but then expands to other vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have someone, this is a 
tiny bit off topic, but it is about vaccinations and, and you know, it's something that's swirling around a lot is um, just some comment co commentary about the coagulation risk with the AZ vaccine. I know a lot of people are concerned and there's been conflicting uh, answers. So if, you, if you're up to date on that, maybe you could share that information. Yeah, so I, I won't speak too much to it just to keep the focus more on, um, on timing of vaccines and addressing kind of pneumococcal vaccines. Um, but I do think it's, it's almost like a moving target right now. Um, so the information changes all the time. I would tell patients that there is um, strong uh, data that was required in order for the vaccines to become um, approved and to use them and that we still have confidence in the vaccine approval process and in COVID-19 vaccines in general. Um, I would say same thing, like I have received a COVID-19 vaccine and it was whichever vaccine was offered to me. Um, and then having that conversation with patients to see what their specific concern is. Do they have a family history of clots that that's why they're specifically concerned and trying to address that. Um, and then reminding them of that ongoing risk of COVID-19. So are they more likely to have that clotting incident or to have COVID-19? And really speaking to the fact that COVID-19 can also increase your clotting risk. They're seeing really high rates of strokes in patients who have had COVID-19. Um, so trying to have that balanced conversation with them. Yeah, it's a it's a tough situation. It's uh, There's uh, so much information and every single piece is just blown right out. And, you know, I think in my opinion is, is that people just, they don't understand what they hear, but they hear a bunch of stuff and it just sounds like that's controversial. I don't hear controversial stuff elsewhere, but you can't, like you're making a huge decision that, that the risk of what you think of a very small risk is, is, is balanced off against a huge risk of getting COVID. And so we have to we have to always consider that there are certain groups that they're they're not recommending the AZ vaccine to, and and that's fine. But there's lots of others. It's so certainly a safe safe vaccine, and it's like that with everybody. It's it's like that with all vaccines. It's that decision about the risk of one thing versus the risk of something else, and you'd have to balance the two out. Um, well, Tiana, I think uh, that's the end of our questions, and uh, I want to thank you very much for your presentation. Um, again, you will receive the presentation in a backup email that will come out after this. There's a survey. I really like it if you could fill out the survey. That's much, much, much appreciated. The recording of this evening's event is going to be posted on our website. All of the right doses are, are put on our website. O OPA Today website. You can see it at any, any time. Um, and uh, I also want to thank very much Phil um, McDonald at uh, Pfizer Canada for her support of this and ongoing support of let's get out there and get people safe from pneumococcal in addition to COVID. So, so I want everyone to have a great evening and to uh, and appreciate your attendance this evening. Thank you so much.